Excuse me, bro. Is this, uh, is this your Rolls Royce? What do you do for a living? Meet the most interesting man on the planet, otherwise known as Abdullah Kudrath. Over the last decade, AK has not only been an emergency room doctor, but he has emerged as one of the most prominent entrepreneurs throughout Houston, Texas by creating over seven companies. And we've got a Lamborghini Urus SUV with a wide body kit. Over here you see a red Ferrari 458, naturally aspirated. But this is definitely my childhood dream car. So this is the Lamborghini Diablo. I sat down with him to figure out how he was able to build multiple eight-figure businesses, all while being able to save lives on a weekly basis. The first time I felt like I needed to go from being a doctor to a businessman was actually when I was doing a medical trip in East Africa. I realized as just one person, as one doctor with a medical bag, I could barely scratch the surface of any real problem. But I realized if I could learn learn how to build institutions and understand operations, I can build entities that last a lot longer than I can last. AK revealed to me some of the most fascinating lessons that he's learned from being a doctor for some of the wealthiest people in the entire world. People don't care about anything when their health is on the line. And, and that's actually really important because we can really get caught up in our pursuit for business and money. Millions of dollars and they just struck it big and millions are coming in. And they're telling me, you know, doc, that means nothing to me. I wish I could just have my belly back. This guy had stomach cancer. Because I'd trade it all if I could have my belly back. In this interview, you will learn from one of the most successful entrepreneurs throughout the entire country, how to find success and create wealth no matter what industry you are in. What's going on everyone? Welcome back to another episode of 10 Questions with a Millionaire. I'm James and I'm out in Houston, Texas with a very special guest. We're here with AK today who's an ER doctor but he's not just an ER doctor he's also a serial entrepreneur owns and has been building tons of businesses over the last numerous years out in Houston Texas so could you give a little bit of an introduction a background on yourself uh, where you started and kind of what you're doing today because I will say you're probably one of the most interesting persons I've ever met and had a conversation with well I appreciate that uh, yeah my name is AK I am formally trained as an emergency room doctor I still do that I love being a doctor and working in the, the ERs um, but I've also branched out. I've focused on business and uh, entrepreneurship. Started with an uh, emergency department, and I've built several of those. Then I've diversified a little bit to create a physician group where I hire other doctors to work in outside hospitals. And then I diversified into other industries. So we have a limo company, an office space company, learning some real estate development, building some lake homes, um, a Botox and filler company, we built a lounge in Midtown, wow. um, and maybe a few more smaller ones. Definitely, that's that's amazing. And how long have you been an ER doctor for? Oh man, I've been a doctor in practice for about seven or eight years now. So you've been a doctor the last, let's say, eight years. Mm -hmm. During that time, what's the most fascinating thing that you've learned about people? Oh man, that's a great question. Um, actually, I don't know why this popped in my mind, but. I, now I think about it, this is a good one. Uh, people don't care about anything when their health is on the line, other than their health. And, and that's actually really important because we can really get caught up in our pursuit for business and money, right? And that's great because we talked about doing good things with it, right? But don't get so caught up that you forget the fact that you've got health and your family's got health and that's something to be appreciated now because I've seen patients who have millions of dollars and they just struck it big and millions are coming in and they're telling me, you know, doc, that means nothing to me. I wish I could just have my belly back. This guy had stomach cancer. Because I'd trade it all if I could have my belly back, right? So uh, I, I've learned that when it comes to humans, when it comes to people, we all want what we want and that's great. But let's not forget what we have and what we have is health. Um, so I think that is important to create a balance in our life as we pursue, as we take our health and make big things out of ourselves. Let's not forget our health too. Right. So you had gone to school originally to become a, a medical professional and you are an ER doctor, but you also became an entrepreneur. So what was the turning point like in your life that told you, I kind of want to go out on my own, invest in myself and start creating companies? Well, I guess the, the first time I felt like I needed to go from being a doctor to a businessman, was actually when I was doing a medical trip in East Africa. I got invited with a small church to go and, and see people in the villages. And long story short is while I was out there, I realized as just one person, as one doctor with a medical bag, I could barely scratch the surface of any real problem. Now, I'd like to think it's meaningful for the people we saw. We saw about 250 people a day. Um, but I realized if I could learn how to build institutions 
and understand operations, I can build entities that last a lot longer than I can last. Um, so I came back into the country with this inspiration to learn not just how to be a doctor, but how do I create the entire facility and then grow that. Cool. So in the previous answer, you brought up scaling, and that's something that a lot of entrepreneurs really struggle with in today's world. You know, maybe they have a great idea, they start that business, but they really don't know how to really scale it and grow it. So what's the biggest thing that you implement throughout the companies that you're a part of to really scale them in terms of growth? Maybe it's people, maybe it's capital. What's the secret to scaling? How can you really take a business from six to seven figures in today's world? If you're doing everything yourself, you only have so much hours in a day, right? So if you want to scale, you need to have somebody to replace some of your task. And even if it's not one person to do everything you can do, they need to be some of the parts, right? Like, for example, I've got a friend with a clothing store and is doing very well and he's there all the time. Now, how is he going to open more locations if he doesn't have somebody to work in that store, right? Now, how are you going to get someone to work in that store if you don't know how to select people, if you don't know how to train people? So this comes into a new skill set, which is creating a standard operating procedure, right? If you look at some of the biggest companies in the world, like McDonald's, even around here, Chick-fil-A, Microsoft, they have it written in a book. Everything you say, everything you do needs to be written and standardized so that you can hand this book to someone else who can then hire and do everything that you said. Now, that being said, while that's a requirement, no one's going to run the company the way you're going to run the company. That's why even with those same standard operating procedures, the CEO changes and the company goes down, right? So you still have to be able to provide supervision as the owner, as a CEO, to make sure the company is heading in the right direction. Sometimes that's as simple as, uh, I say simple, but um, as um, seemingly simple as making sure you're inspiring all of your managers. And if you're an absentee leader, or if you're, if you're cracking the whip a little too hard, or you're not cracking it enough, or whatever the dynamic is, if you're not inspiring your people, um, providing them the right benefits, or the right information, or the right tools they need, then your organization is gonna keep suffering because you're not there. So to answer the question to scale, it's gonna be understanding how to standardize what you do, how to train people what you do, and how to select the right people that can be the sum of your parts. Wow. What's the greatest lesson that you've ever learned from a mentor throughout your career? It's like, what's the best piece of advice that you've ever received from a mentor? Maybe it's an influential figure or a father, any, anybody in your life that taught you, you know, uh, that gave you some advice, taught you a lesson, what would that be? I think the biggest thing I ever heard was from my father. And it was when I had got accepted into med school. Uh, I, was, I was ready for it, but he said, son, it's going to be difficult. And I'm like, eh, I got this, right? I'm, I'm ready. He goes, no, you don't know yet, but it's going to be difficult. And he said, if you do it for yourself, when the going gets tough and you stumble and fall, you may not want to get back up. You might say to yourself, hey, it's comfortable down here. I'll just, I'll just stick around for a while. He said, but if you do it carrying the flag of the people around you, your family, your community, your country, your world, then no matter what, when you fall down and you look up and you see the flag you're carrying, then you'll always get back up. And he was right. When things got difficult, I thought about that. And then giving up or staying down was never an option for me. It was so much easier when you're doing it for somebody else or for a greater purpose. And it wasn't just for med school. I think in everything in my life, when I approach it that way, it's not just for myself, it's for a greater purpose. I think it's easier to accomplish the task or have the resolve that you need to never give up. It's a beautiful answer. And I wanted to ask, um, what has been the most amount of money that you've ever made in a single year? <laughs> oh, man. Um, I, I actually don't like talking about finances, right? Um, but, it, uh, you know, there's some good years and, th and there's some bad years. And sometimes people hear a couple of million, they're like, oh, man, he's got all this money. It's great money, and I'm super excited about it. But you got to keep account how much goes to taxes and how much you're going to reinvest for growth, right? So it's not like I can... I can necessarily, I want to spend it right away, you know, but uh, we'll, we'll say a couple million in a, a year and we'll leave it at that. <laughs> For sure. Okay. Over the last, you know, few years, what would you say is the best financial decision that you ever made? If there's one particular decision, maybe it's an investment, maybe it was opening a particular business. What would you say was the best financial decision that you ever made? Um, the best financial decision was the first one, the first business, right? Um, I can't remember who said it. I know... T. Boone Pickens might have repeated it in his book, or maybe he has credit for saying it, but 
the saying goes, the first million is the hardest, right? And that's so true because once you have money, then you can, you've got comfort, you can start investing in other projects. You don't have to work like a dog for a couple of years to get that initial money again, to get that, that match to light the fire. Um, so the, the best financial decision I made was to save a lot and take the risk. But of course, you got to calculate your risk and you got to be prepared to lose it. You got to have your backup plan and you have to say, if you lose the ego, you say, I'm going to do whatever it takes to make sure this works and this ship does not sink. So not having, the, you can't fear. Don't, don't fear loss. Don't fear poverty is what my father used to tell me. Uh, that way you can work hard, take the money and not be uh, too afraid to take the money and invest in a business. Sometimes you're going to lose. Sometimes you're going to win, but if you don't try, you're never going to learn the skill set you need to keep growing. Wow. And what's been your secret to self-improvement you know, throughout your career in any, regardless of the industry you've been in, but just in general, like how have you constantly been able to get better in terms of knowledge, in terms of perspective, in terms of the people around you? What is your secret to self-improvement? I think one thing my father taught me was um, to never point fingers. There's always blame to go around, but he always made me focus on what I could do differently. Right? I mean, I go, oh, that person did this, or this person did that, or who are they to, that doesn't matter, right? Because if, if now you're the one in charge and it's your project or it's your future, it doesn't really matter who, who's to blame, right? All that matters is, in a way, just blame yourself. Say, how could I have known that that wouldn't have worked? How could I, I have seen this disaster coming or this, you know, this miscalculation or this failure? Instead of just blaming everybody else, say, okay, Next time, I'm going to make sure that doesn't happen. Either I'm going to train somebody better, I'm going to select them better. I need to do more background information. I should have worked harder. So I think always holding yourself accountable is the key to growth. Because if you always think that you didn't do anything wrong and everybody else did everything wrong, you're never going to get any better. Uh, you know, obviously, you've you know, created a bunch of companies over a bunch of different industries. And entrepreneurship's hard. What would you say is the biggest challenge that you faced as an entrepreneur? Have you been able to overcome that ultimately? The biggest challenge as an entrepreneur is, um, I guess, different phases have different challenges, right? The first challenge is how do I get started, right? How do I get the knowledge? How do I get the money? And then how do I become the person that's not going to squander it all if it was handed to me, right? How do I become an honest, good person, right? That's the hard step. Uh, because I promise you, I can give somebody who's like, I want to be an entrepreneur, here's $1 million, okay, and then here's all the books you need, or I'll teach you as you go, and they'll still screw it up because they'll get greedy, they'll get emotional, they won't do what they say, or they'll sit on their butts instead of doing the next step, and they won't meet the deadlines, right? I promise you, I can do that. So you got to have those things, but you got to be the right person that's ready to accept those things, to build those things, and utilize them as a good leader. Um, but then later, the hard thing about entrepreneur is, okay, do I diversify now or later? Because now you're taking bigger bets. Like I might have needed, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars to start or tens of thousands to start. Now I'm betting on a million dollar and I could lose everything I started with. And I could financially ruin myself. And now the stakes are higher, right? So the challenge is now, okay, how do I calculate these risks? Um, and then I think the bigger challenge is once you start making so much money and you could retire, but you don't because you're built this way, right? Okay, I got 10 million in the bank. Do I retire now? Could. But I just spent my whole life trying to learn how to shake and move. I'm not built that way now. So now you got to ask yourself, well, how do you find the balance in your life? That's the challenge. Are you spending so much time that you, f you fail to get a relationship and have kids, right? Or you had kids and you didn't spend enough time with them? Or your parents are now getting older and you, you could have called, you could have wrote, you could have visited, right? So then you have to ask yourself, okay, life is more to it than this. How do I put it all together? So I think the challenges for the entrepreneur are very, very different depending on what stage you're in. Right. And if you could spend the day with one influential figure, dead or alive, who would that person be? Uh, Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin. Man, I, I would love to meet that guy. Uh, because not only was he an intelligent dude that made all these inventions, we know him from like, oh, he, he discovered electricity and all these inventions. But he was a, also a very big statesman and a, a diplomat. He single-handedly stopped wars between the Americans, the French, and the British. Why? Because all three of them respected him. So if he said, guys, let's talk, 
They say, sure, Ben, for you, let's talk. So how do you get to that point? One, you got to make something of yourself. One, you got to be on the second, you got to be honest. You got to treat everybody fairly and people got to know that, hey, if he talks, we should listen. And I think that kind of diplomacy and that type of understanding of people and that type of um, ambition to be able to sit, to bring three of the biggest superpowers back to the table when they're fighting, I think is very admirable. So I'd love to meet a guy like that and hear what he has to say. And how can, how can I become more like him? Yeah. And I've never asked this to anyone before, but I'm curious because it seems like you're very like uh, renowned and versatile kind of on like your like world history. But what would you say is the best lesson that you've learned from studying world history? If there's you know, one particular lesson that you focused on or that you've studied a lot, what would you say that is? We just keep getting duped. We just keep getting fooled as humans over and over again, right? It's the same old story in a new timeline. People want to rise to power. People want to take advantage of others. They want to take advantage of the poor and the weak, right? They want to pit people against each other. They're constantly making us fight so they can rise to power, right? And we keep falling for the same tricks. If you keep looking in history, the same tricks that they've done uh, before we had TV and social media, whether they walked the streets and, and sold a narrative, and then they gave yellow journalism and newspapers to, sh to sell a nar narrative, or they push things on social media to sell a narrative. We keep falling for this, these emotional decisions and we keep fighting each other and we keep drawing hard lines in the sands and we argue over things all the time that don't really matter, right? Instead of doing that, we should actually find real solutions. But we can't because we've already determined that you are on the other side of this, this ideologic argument. So whatever you say, I'm gonna argue with you. And I wish that as humans, we can look back in history and say, this is our nature to be tribal. How do, we, how do we become more constructive and actually find it in our nature to work together and to understand each other and understand why you're coming from that position and why I'm coming from this position and what do we do about it now to make it better for everybody? Beautiful answer. Wow. What's the greatest lesson that your father taught you? The greatest lesson I learned from my father is the one I keep saying which is don't get caught up with the money. And you can't say it enough because I've seen so many people change because I got money, right? It's not about the money. It's about the personal growth. Who are you as a person? Because say, say I had 100 million right now and you took it away from me, who am I, right? How did I get that money? What's left? What's left as a man or a woman if you take away the money tomorrow that you've earned? Do people still say, Man, I love that guy, he's a great person. He helped me with this, he helped me with that, he looks out for people around him, he's a good friend, he's a good family member, right? So the number one thing I learned from my father is, yes, you want to do good in everything you do, and then money will hopefully become a byproduct if it's written for you, right? But who, who, is a, who are you as a person? That's way more important. So that way you don't get caught up in the money, you don't get caught up in the pursuit of things you remember that as you acquire your businesses and financial strength and political strength, you're always protecting the most important thing, which is who you are as a person, so that, that when you get that money, it doesn't change you. Guys, that wraps up today's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. Be sure to like and subscribe for tons of amazing content coming soon. AK, thank you so much for joining us today. A pleasure. Where can everybody find you? Um, I guess uh, I'm fairly active on Instagram. Uh, it's just my first initial A and then my last name Kudrath, K-U-D-R-A-T-H. And uh, I actually want to start doing some more video series on medical related stuff for the general population and also car stuff because everyone's a fan of the cars. And then we can maybe get you guys back on to do more business related things as well. There we go. Mm -hmm. Perfect.